Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 101, Desperation Leads to Despair. It was a dark time, defeated, all his principality taken, and only the smallest measures kept. Llewellyn, with a crumb, returned to Gwyneth, to the boundaries that existed in 1247 after the death of his uncle David. It was a complete and utter disaster one that could have ended with his life being taken had Edward kept to his original plan. By the fall of 1277, negotiations were completed, and by November 2nd he had abased himself to the leadership of the king. He acknowledged his overlordship and promised to pay £50,000 fee to secure peace between them. As well, if he wanted Gwyneth's breadbasket, Anglesey, it would cost him an additional £1,000. This amount dwarfed the original demand of 1267 and would only gain him basically one quarter of the territory he had had before and less than that in which to raise the money with. Llewellyn basically at this point is bankrupt. His military is effectively finished. His territory taken. His ability to fight the English throne is negligible at best at this stage, and probably in even worse shape than even he could have imagined. The only territory that the prince now controlled was the western half of Gwyneth, not including Anglesey, which of course was not given back to the prince at the end of the war, but actually seized by the king. But David had won big concessions, and in the process, had gained control of half of the four cantrips, the other half, of course, going to the King Edward. He also had something Llewellyn didn't, heirs. And this gave him a lot more to pass on to his descendants and an ability to pass it on. And this must have also frustrated Llewellyn because all land on Gwyneth's western side of the Conwy would go to whomever had heirs at that point, at the death of Llewellyn. So, in other words, David's sons could inherit all of Gwyneth, while Llewellyn could be shut out completely, and his heirs may not gain anything. This, of course, remained very frustrating. In the agreements that they eventually signed, Llewellyn kept his title, Prince of Wales, but it was a title in name only. There was no principality anymore. It was gone. What little he was left with was effectively his original lordship, which was over the Snowdonian region of Wales. And even that, there was discussions and arguments about whether or not he would have to share that with his brothers. In the end, they signed an agreement which allowed David to have the English portion of Gwyneth and kept him out of the Welsh side while shutting out the other brother entirely. So at least in that respect, Llewellyn had kept some of his land. Either way, this treaty was certainly very much like the Treaty of 1247. It was a bed of broken glass for the prince to walk barefoot on. Given the monetary expense now added, he would be unable to gather enough armed men to resist again. He would not have the financial wherewithal to even pay himself out of the debt he'd incurred, and would have no ability to raise the basic subsistence of medieval life, which is the grain and agricultural profit that he would have gained in the breadbasket of Anglesey. All of this would have left him with very little. At least one has to imagine that was Edward's play here. That's what he wanted. He wanted his vassal to be humiliated and kept at bay. The fact that it set in place what amounted to the next war may not have been obvious to Edward. It may not even been obvious to Llewellyn or his contemporaries, but certainly there's. it's pretty obvious to us looking at it that when you put someone in this position it almost guarantees that the next war will be happening. The prince was effectively neutered, his allies removed, and his vexatious brother, who had even caused the king to find him annoying, was now back being Llewellyn's problem. 
At the end of 1277, Llewellyn finally pays homage to the king, and in so doing was able to negate paying the great fees and the extra costs that the treaty had called for in addition to reacquiring Anglesey. In other words, because he did homage to the king, Edward gave him back the land he already held, and in a way stopped him from paying such a massive debt. Now, one wonders if Edward saw this as a mercy and saw this as a way to rebuild his friendship and solidarity with Llewellyn, but if that was the case, I don't think he did a wonderful job of it. Certainly Llewellyn must not have felt that way because, as we'll see going forward, his annoyance with Edward will continue. In early 1278, Edward must have felt that he was satisfied, having achieved his goal of pushing both Scotland and Wales back into alignment with English concerns and the Marcher families firmly in English hands. Llewellyn now had no connection to the Marches. His borders were now surrounded by the king and his fellow Welsh nobility, and he was hemmed in from being able to take any of it. In fact, the best he could do was legally take his concerns to an English court which, of course, puts him on the back foot almost immediately. It treats him not as a prince of Wales, but just another lord in the English nobility. This understanding would be short-lived, but it did allow for Edward to finally achieve a measure of peace and for Llewellyn to prepare his own line for the next stage, passing his principality on to the next generation. In the autumn of 1278, the two men gathered again, this time, Edward felt his point was made. Llewellyn had realized who was boss and was committed to make peace work. At least that was the way Edward had seen Llewellyn seeking judicial decisions over fighting the marcher lords. In other words, he'd taken them to court. Thus, using the English law system was seen by Edward as him obeying Edward's orders and being a proper vassal. To Edward, at least in written documents, Llewellyn was now appropriately in the camp of his control, and thus was learning his place. Whether he really believed this, we'll never know, but if that was his actual feelings or if that was just his legal feelings. But the fact that it was written in both private and public letters probably shows that he had thought water was under the bridge. The Prince of Wales, now mostly a title rather than actuality, knew he had to play for time. And in the autumn of 1278, with his humility now shown to Edward, the king was in a generous mood, at least what he saw as generous. As I mentioned earlier, first he removed the demand of the 50,000 pounds and the extra 1,000 for Anglesey, so 51,000 in total, allowing Llewellyn to avoid any more financial issues, returning him to simply having to pay the excess of what he had gained in 1267, but without the lands and titles that that would have incurred. Giving Anglesey back at least made sense as it allowed them to raise crops on a larger scale and would, and without it would have left Llewellyn and his people in desperate straits because, of course, that was one of his few sources of income. Then at last, Llewellyn and his bride were united, married, in fact, as well as in name, and they were married in an English cathedral, surrounded by English lords, by an English priest, and the bride was given away by her cousin, King Edward himself, on the feast day of St. Edward, the patron saint of England at the time. The symbolism of the moment had to be rather obvious. The prince could not have missed it. It must have stuck in his mind as another point of contention. On top of all of this, of course, Edward made further demands of Llewellyn during his marriage ceremonies, thus, in effect, blackmailing him into this marriage that he desired so badly. And once again, I think Edward underestimated how that would be perceived by his prince. By the end of 1278, at least peace had come to Wales. Llewellyn must at this stage have become consumed by legacy and inheritance, not the least of which, because of the treaty, must have enforced the idea that he needed 
to begin to concern himself over the raising of children. And, of course, his new marriage to Eleanor must have taken some measure of that. As far as we know, their relationship was peaceable and appeared to be a happy one. It's hard to know because, of course, it would only last for four years. But at that stage and at this point, it appeared to be a positive one. And while we have no evidence one way or the other, from what little we do have, it appears to have been a good one. And it would, of course, protect him if he had children to avoid the issue of inheritance with David and be able to protect his kingdom and principality from more interruptions and problems. And, of course, I would assume he would be hoping that primogenitor would control the Welsh habit of fighting each other over lands and titles when there was more than one possible heir. As well, Llewellyn likely nursed his annoyance at the way things had gone down. He would later consider the king to have slighted and humiliated him even on his wedding day. Edward might have felt in control, but it appears to have been one born of arrogance, not fact. Much like the Scottish situation years later, it would be one which would lead to rebellion. In 1279, Edward and Llewellyn spent time in family concerns as opposed to their disputes. Llewellyn remained relatively quiet for the next few years in public view. The king, on the other hand, was busy with affairs in France, trying to sort out other issues that we'll discuss in a couple minutes, and having a daughter who died shortly thereafter. Llewellyn and his bride returned to Wales and what seems to, as we said earlier, seems to be a happy life, if the chroniclers can be believed. The Chronicle of the Princes, for example, went more or less silent on concerns outside of the church, focusing instead on the changes at Strata Florida in ecclesiastical leadership. And, of course, this makes some sense because it's felt that the the brute was actually compiled at Strata Florida, so obviously that would concern them, if no one else. Meanwhile, in England... In 1280, the king and his court created a new coin, which would be called the groat, which would help raise more money for the crown because, of course, as you bring in new money that somebody has to buy and somebody has to use and there's interest in it because it was a different denomination, it would lead to more taxes coming in for the crown and more finances helping in that respect. As part of another scheme to raise money, the king also charged anyone who owned over 20 pounds worth of land in order for them to become a knight. This meant that they had to pay for peerages, even if they'd already been knighted previously, which, of course, probably didn't really bother the common people, but certainly would have annoyed the landholders. And, of course, they may have passed that on to those that lived under them, but nonetheless, this idea of making the peers pay for the king's concerns certainly was an old and well-tested idea. On top of all this, Edward started an investigation of Jews for cutting coins. This was seen as both counterfeiting and cheating the crown out of money by devaluing the coin. Because, of course, especially if you look back in ancient times, coin cutting was something of a popular thing. Because if you wanted to give somebody money, but you didn't you know, it was, the worth of the item wasn't as much as the cost of the coin. Rather than giving them the whole coin and maybe getting back not enough change, you just cut the coin in half or bits off of it to pay for the item, which, of course, would lead to these coins being debased in cost because, of course, their face value is no longer accurately presented anymore. So this was one of the things that they looked at as sort of a way of getting back that change and trying to enforce that change was by making a capital crime to actually do this. And of course, because of that, some people got targeted more than others. And in this specific case, this would be the Jews of England. As they would in other parts of medieval Europe, they became under pressure from this idea that they were the ones who were doing this. And this was at a time in medieval European history where Jews were being persecuted quite heavily. They were made to wear designations that 
des designated them as separate from the English and from Europe as a whole. This is the point where they had to wear yellow stars. Or in some cases, like in Italy, they had to wear strange hats and other things so that you knew they were different and it would isolate them from the rest of society. And in that respect, of course, they were also limited on what they could do for work and how they would gain income and then restricted from some of those sources of income in what seems like a completely hypocritical situation, as you can imagine. And in the end, 600 Jews were actually taken prisoner, and over 300 of them were actually executed over this issue of coin cutting, which, to put this in perspective, the amount of Jews it has been estimated lived in England at the time was 3,000. So if 300 are killed, that's one-tenth of the population of the English Jews were actually executed at this time period. Within 11 years, they'd actually be completely kicked out of England altogether. And all of their lands, titles, financial gain was all seized as the crown was looking to raise money in yet another attempt to try and fight wars and gain land and keep places. And, of course, to make their own population happy because they had spent so much time making these people feel like other that it became an easy method to attack them and take their land. Um, as we've discussed in earlier times, up to this point, there wasn't a lot of Jewish population in Wales simply because there wasn't the same urbanization to this stage. And that was part of the reason because of the limitations in what they could and couldn't do. In the conquered lands around Aberystwyth, for example, and in the east around Flint and Rudland, massive projects were begun which would see the start of castles that would dot the landscape encircling the native Welsh in the north. Slowly, the English goal was to create fortified towns where English immigrants would mix with the Welsh in an effort to create a population which was considered to be more stable and accepting of English customs, laws, and, of course, control. These towns were the first ones in the native areas to this point. While many communities were growing in the south, massive urbanization had not started yet to the north. But this was changing under Edward. He was determined to create more controlled populations while building symbols of authority which would stand in many parts of Wales to this day. The Ring of Iron, as of course it would be called, would be the bone of contention with the Welsh and the English ever since the first stone was laid. And as we head into the 1280s, further problems would grow up between the English and the Welsh leadership because they would have periods of starvation in the winter of 1281-82. There was a massive famine which came about due to problems with how rough the winter was and, and a lack of growing food. And because of this, it would in all likelihood be sort of the tinderbox in which all the grievances that had been created and had been growing started to become more prevalent in the Welsh and there became this sense of hostility between what was perceived to be English overlordship. At this point, uh, spontaneous, in quotes, uprisings began in the east in the areas controlled by the crown in the four cantrips, and there is some accusation or at least some suspicion that they were probably egged on by the leadership of the native Welsh and that this came about in part because those that had sided with Llewellyn early in his uprisings in the late 1250s and early 1260s had, after 1277, started to have buyer's remorse over what the English crown was doing and the perspective of how Welsh customs were not being respected, Welsh law was not being respected, and that now the English were demanding that the Welsh follow their laws and their customs, and that the crown was becoming less and less sympathetic to their point of view. The leader of all of this turns out to be David, at least at the beginning, and it is him that leads some of these forces into this initial rebellion at the beginning of 1282, around actually Easter time, and this period in between 
what was considered to be the Holy Week. And all of this creates a problem because, of course, this is supposed to be the most Christian time of year. It's supposed to be a time of peace. There were some thoughts in at least the writings of the time period that you weren't supposed to fight during this period. And, of course, instead, this is where the Welsh uprisings began. So you can kind of see where this problem would be exacerbated. And next time when we start to talk about this rebellion in full, we'll go further into some of the battles and kind of where everything eventually, of course, ends up. But at this point, it should be noted that at least from the historian's point of view and from the Chronicle's point of view, this rebellion started with people who weren't necessarily the prince, weren't necessarily his brothers or leaders, but rather in what amounts to a popular uprising, one of which that actually saw English towns pillaged as much as land taken for Welsh native leaders, and as much it was, as it was an anarchy rather than a focused attack or focused control. But one could also point out that this also shows a lot of commonality to some of the things that went on in 1257, because again, remember that the whole start of that particular disagreement and rebellion and general seizing of land began because people in the four cantors were sick and tired of being ruled by English leaders and started to overthrow them. And there were accusations by both historians and people at the time that it was likely done with the, if not the direct influence of Llewellyn, certainly with the idea that he wasn't turning it down or wasn't really too concerned about it. Either way, next time we'll get into the actual rebellion itself and the outcome. And in future episodes, we will talk about the aftermath of everything that happened and what that meant to Wales going forward as now a part of England, in fact, as well as in paper. Anyway, until next time, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me at Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at Welsh History Pod or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. Coming up on 5-Minute News. I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily.